Right, welcome to another edition of the Iron Hour podcast. Um, I'm Barry, as you know, I'm joined by Marco, Gareth, and excitingly this time by Scunthorpe United chairman and owner David Hilton. How are you feeling, David? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm good. Yeah. Very, very softly spoken to kick off. <laughs> I'm sure it'll heat up. Yeah. Um, you, how would you like to be addressed, David? Dave? Sir. Sir? sir. No. Um, Dave, Dave's fine. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Dave's sir. fine. <laughs> Dave, okay. Um, and obviously, a big shout out to our sponsors, No Film, who are doing absolute bits for us. They've come on site today to record us here at Ilkeston Town Football Club, which, you know, the, the news broke this week, didn't it? That, that will be the, the, the training facility probably short term, I guess we can get on to that um, for the Scunthorpe United coming up. Right, I'm going to jump straight into the interview then, Dave, if that's okay. So you mentioned in your statement, um, so you touched on some of the reasons why you purchased Scunthorpe United. Do you regret any decision to purchase the club? That's a nice easy one to start with. Um, yes and no. You know, I think before purchasing Scunthorpe, I was in a comfort zone. Um, life was comfortable. Life was much easier. Um, and it's been, a, it's been a tough week. It's been a tough week. I think I expected, I certainly expected some negativity and some, um, some people to be untrusting um, of me, of, of my staff, of, um, of the plans. But what I, what I didn't expect is the veracity of some of what is happening. Um, I expected, and I believe I've paid um, the amount of money that I've put in so far. I, I, I've paid for the right to have a bit of time. Um, and that, I think that's the only downside for me. I don't feel like um, I'm being given that time at the minute to, to try and implement the plans that I have. You know, At the end of the day, I'm not putting the money into the football club to lose the money. I have to implement the plans for the for the plans to work for the club to progress, um, and for me to achieve some sort of benefit for the money that I'm putting in. Um, quite clearly, there's no financial benefit from owning a football club, as I spoke about before. So there was not regret. You know, it's just been tough. And if I could turn the clock back and maybe look and say, I could see this, you know, happening. Would I have been so keen at the start? I can't say for certain that I would have been. Um, but I'm here now. Um, I, I can't have regrets. I don't really have time for regret. I've just got to just got to crack on, suck it up and crack on. So with that in mind then, are you would you still say you are very committed to the football club of Scunthorpe United and will you continue to invest in the, like, in the players that you have so far since you've come in? 100%. 100%. So it's looking like relegation is very likely at this point, down to the sixth tier. Um, you've already invested quite heavily in the players for this season. How will the budget compare next season to, to the likes of the money that you've invested so far? It's difficult to talk numbers at the minute purely because the budget has to be sustainable. So there's, as we've spoken about and we're going to speak about, you, you, you know, not just in my statement that people are already aware of, but obviously we'll speak about it today, no doubt. Some of the questions will be around the cost-cutting exercises at the club. Um, there are other areas um, that we need to sharpen up to make sure they're cost-effective. Yeah. We then have, um, obviously, current playing staff, so I need to sit down with the manager and see how that looks in respect of who he wants to retain, who's going to leave, and how their salaries with the current playing staff that we've got look um th there's a lot still you know sponsorship levels once the stadium is into the company will the membership levels pick up so there's a lot that can still be incorporated the more that comes in will all be put into the playing budget so the more the playing budget can be season ticket sales there's so much that you know, shirt sales, we could go on and on and on. At the end of the day, a sustainable club means that the income revenue that comes into the club, arguably the majority of that will go into the playing budget because of the cost cutting exercises that we're putting in place. And, and that will be as high as we can make it. Um, I anticipate that we've already know we're going to be full time. You know, we'll never be a part time on the pitch. Um, I envisage that we will 
almost certainly have the highest playing budget in the division. Um, I think that goes without saying with the size of the fan base that we have and the size of the club that we are. We'll certainly certainly have the biggest playing budget in the division. Um, unless there's, there's a couple of surprises, I don't want to be disrespectful to other clubs because I don't know what their budgets are. But it, it, you know, if we're not the biggest, we'll certainly be, be high up there. Um, and yeah, so I can't put a number on it right now, but everything that we are doing is based around making that figure as, as big as possible. I think we're going to move on now to some quite difficult and awkward topics. So I'd like to say to those listening and watching, um, you know, you, you have made this very clear to us in the build-up to this interview that you will not be vetting any questions. You will basically take any questions from us. You even offered on multiple occasions to do this interview live. So, you know, we'd like to make that very clear that you, you, you have continuously told us in the build-up to this that you have nothing to hide, do you, David? No, not at all. So with that in mind, I think I'd like to touch one of the really crucial topics from the statement. It's certainly to me, personally, it was, it was a big one. Um, and it obviously regards the academy. I'll touch again. For those of you that have listened to the previous episodes, you'll know my son plays in the Scunthorpe United Academy. So this is something that is quite emotionally charged for me. Um, you knew that. You still agreed to do this interview. So we are thankful for that. But the first question I would ask you was, the statement kind of said that the academy will effectively close from the end of the season. Was every option, every other option explored before you came to that conclusion? Hmm. <sighs> to a degree, it maybe should have been explored more. Um, but I think, and without making excuses, when you come into a football club, um, there's a hell of a lot going off, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, you know, the academy was one of the first things that I did look at. I've showed you guys a message that I can't, you know, you know who it was to, you know it was somebody senior at the club, and you then saw the corresponding messages that mentions people within the academy, so you're fully aware that on the 9th of March, I stipulated that the academy would close. You know, I, I, in that message, I explained very clearly that the year one scholars need to be found a club for their year two. And that was my mindset because we we needed to, 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 to we were going to lose the funding. And therefore, the, the club, if the club is to progress, quite simply, the academy needed to, to end. Um, temporarily, might I add, but it needed to end until we got back to where we wanted to be. Um, I did ask people to come back to me with ideas of how we could potentially restructure and how it could look. Um, a scaled back version. A scaled work. back version. And things were bought, to, in all honesty, things were bought to me. Um, but the problem was to scale back in the avenue of basically not having the EFL fund. If we had the EFL funding, we have to work by the EFL guidelines. Mm -hmm. And the expenses to that and, and how we are governed means that it is extremely costly to run the academy. If we don't take the FL funding and we may, maybe have our, our own model, there is payments that we have to pay back. So me closing the academy, there is payments that I would probably have to pay back to the EFL because we've closed it prematurely um, whilst there was still funding available. So that, that was the feedback that I was getting, but that was, that was pretty much it. Um, but I do want to reiterate, I'm not trying to push this on anybody else. I'm not going to mention names. But people at the club were fully aware that my mindset was to close the academy. And if that has not been relayed right the way down to the parents and the children and, and the coaching staff within the academy, then my sincere apologies for that. that that's a breakdown of communication. It, it shouldn't have happened. Um, however, the people were fully aware that that was my mindset. In respect of looking at it moving forward, I went back. Um, so the, the academy management had a meeting with Lee Turnbull yesterday at the club. Um, I wasn't there, but I've had the minutes. I'm fully, I'm fully aware of what the conversations were. And, and I said to them that I'm fully appreciative that the academy is a big part of the community. It's it, a massive yeah, part of the it community. Is. Yeah. It's not a massive part of the football club. And I need people to understand that. That might sound harsh, but it doesn't achieve a lot for the football club other than keep the community engaged mm -hmm. and, and 
you know, and we'll go on to talk about that in a little while because that is a big, you know, it was a big thing for me here. You, you know, you'll, you'll see the kids come here. You know, um, this doesn't have an academy. I closed the academy at Ilkeston um, when I when I took control because it didn't work. It, it was it was a drain on the finances. Um, but we did have a big junior network that we embedded into the club. We put the 4G in and the junior. And, and this is what I wanted. This is what I was asking when I was asking people within, you know, within the club, can we mould this into something different? Um, and quite simply now I'm being told that potentially we can. So is what I've said is that as long as I can see some clear evidence that moving forward next year when we have no funding at all from the EFL, because there's no way we can get back in the EFL if we go down this year. Um, sorry, the season after next season when the funding... So sorry, yeah. yeah. So next season we'll get the, the, the 250k yeah. from the EFL. The following season we won't get anything. Um, but obviously we know that if we go down this year, which is the likelihood that we're not going to be able to get yeah. back in the EFL in time. So we know that the, the funding will stop altogether. And if, if what I don't want to do is prolong something this year and pump funds into it from the first team playing budget or from the football club or from myself, yeah. for only it to finish in a year's time. It, it, there's zero point in that. We may as well just bite that bullet now as, as, as upsetting as it is for, for a lot of people. And it's upsetting for me as well. You know, I don't, I don't want to make these difficult decisions. They just have to be made. You know, it, it is that simple. But I'm being told now that, I mean, I, I've explained that, for instance, the scholarships. The scholarships takes a big proportion of the budget. Yes. Um, so is what I've potentially said to the staff is, can we look at a model where we have it up to eight teams, but rather than have scholarships at the end of that, we maybe have a facility where we can then give any players that we feel are, are good enough full-time contracts immediately rather than scholarships. If any of them want to, to you know, go into further education, can we support them with that further education as well as keeping them at the club on a part-time basis under a contract? Are these things possible? If they are, that would take a big proportion because we're not EFL funded. Yeah. Potentially we could do that and it would keep the rest of the academy open. Then we have to look at self-funding. If the club's got to be sustainable, the academy will have to be sustainable. The way for that to work would be parents paying subs, monthly subs for the children. Um, sponsors coming on board for each age group. So each age group will be responsible for bringing in their own sponsors for their kits, for the training wear. Um, and if the community buys into that and the individual coaches and, and parents buy into that and local businesses buy into that, with the club's help, we'll help, we'll push it, we'll push it as much as we can push it and we'll assist. But literally it has to financially stand on its own two feet. If that can happen and I get the evidence with a business plan that that can happen, then I will back it this year to make sure it stays afloat. And what's your gut feeling on that? Do you think you will get the evidence? Do you think it's still up in the air? Is this a fluid situation? I'm very confident from, from, from the staff's comments. I'm, obviously, I can't comment for every parent. I can't comment for local businesses. You know, at the end of the day, everybody has to buy into it. You know, but if I get a business model in front of me, which I'm being told will be with me within the next few days, that the academy can be sustainable with, with less restrictions on it than we will with the FL funding, you know, based on a slightly different model moving forward, um, then whatever it costs this year, I'll, I'll, I will make the difference and, and we'll keep it going. And, and, I'm, and I'm confident that the staff will make that happen. But, it, but there has to be some of that has to be taken away from me and the club and has to be put on the community and on local businesses, you know, and on the coaching staff and on the academy manager and, and other people, you know, that, that, that are involved. What's the feedback been like, particularly on the academy since the announcement over the weekend? Horrific, you know, but... <clears throat> I'm not on social media, so I don't see a lot of it. I do get snapshots sent to me at times, um, which if anybody's watching this, I don't like. Please don't do it anymore because the whole point of being off there is so that I don't see it. It don't mean that I want snippets here, there and everywhere. You know, at, at the end of the day. Um, but I fully expect that response. You know, I, I fully, I have no issue with people taking issue with me or with the club because we're making difficult decisions. Yeah. There's a hell of a lot of people that understand why, but it's still upsetting yeah. for them. You know? this, is, this is where I sit, okay? I understand that really difficult decisions have to be made, 
but as a keeps saying, you know, it's an emotionally charged topic for a lot of people. This is our club, this is our mm -hmm. community. Even for those of us that don't live in the town anymore, we're still a massive part and it will always be a massive part of us. So sometimes logic goes out of the window and you know, you're emotionally charged by the situation. But so it, it I guess my conclusion from that then is it is a fluid situation that the, the, the fate of the academy hasn't necessarily been sealed yet. No, it's not been decided. If anything, I'm, I'm, I'm far more optimistic now. That I think maybe that, that me putting it in the statement at the weekend has maybe kicked a few arses into gear. Focus some minds. And, yeah. and now people are understanding that it is a serious situation. Um, maybe, maybe some people um, thought that I was bluffing or, or thought that, you know, didn't take my comments and, and my instructions seriously enough. And believe that it would remedy itself, and and the fact that there would be financial consequences having to pay the FL money back if we were to close it early, yeah. you, you know, that that would impact my decision. But it wouldn't have, you know. The only way my decision will be changed is is if I know that we're all rowing in the same direction. We get outside help from the people that the academy is important yeah. to, and and if that happens, then I'm prepared to support it also. Um, but. I'm optimistic that it can happen. I know now there's a hell of a lot of people all fighting to make it happen. I'm, I'm promised that I'll have, I'll have some sort of business plan on my desk after the bank holiday. So, um, and, and listen, I'm not going to just dismiss if there is a viable plan there, even if it needs tweaking. You know, if there's something there that we can work with, we will work with it. This yeah. is not something I want to do. I don't want to close the academy. But, it's something that I have to do if we can't find a way forward with it. Okay, I think you've addressed that topic quite quite clearly. I think we'll move on to the next one, which is, you know, we're obviously here at Ilkeston Town, um, and this is the club that you previously owned, Dave, um, and you announced in the statement as well that certainly as a short-term solution, that was my interpretation, as a short-term solution, you'll be moving the playing side, the training side mm -hmm. um, of the first-team football to Ilkeston, in the week. Do you just want to care to, to comment on that, how that's come about and why you think this is the best place for that? So basically everyone's aware that we've got we've got a pitch at Glanford Park um, and I know people have said look you know it, it was okay in the championship the pitch needs I think 20 twenty-seven thousand pounds have been quoted for a reno and that doesn't include this any. is the training pitch. this is the training pitch that's yeah. at Glanford Park at the minute um, and it also needs drainage installing, which is an extra cost. So we're talking significant monies to keep the training pitch. I mean, I'll be honest with you, there's been at least three training sessions since I've been in that haven't been able to take place okay. and they've had to go on the main pitch just because the drainage is, is so bad on there. It was the very first thing that I noticed when I came in that it's substandard. Um, it's substandard for... For a club of that size um, and again we refer back to the academy the academy are training elsewhere you know if we are to keep the academy the idea is you know people talk about community needs to be all together and um, we need a facility that's bigger we need more pitches we need better pitches um, and somewhere that that feels like a community hub and, and a proper football training facility not just a pitch at the side of a motorway with no drainage that's you know, unusable um, from time to time. So we look to explore options locally, short term, long term, you know, to try and find a viable solution. Um, I always say it wrong, Quibble? Quibble. Quibble, Quibble Park um, was one we spoke to the council about. I think there's American football on there and athletics mm. and we couldn't have, have exclusivity of, of the site at which we need because obviously we can't have people coming and going. Yeah. Um, the level of you know, we have a duty of care to the players. The players are our assets. Um, well, they can, yeah, it needs to be right. That's the whole reason you It needs to be the right training away. facility. Yeah. You can't have it open access. Um, it has to be controlled by the club, and, and that wasn't an option. There wasn't really any other options. Bottisford was one that I discussed with Lee Turnbull, um, and we... My phone's over there. I was going to show you a, a message. We were quoted... 60, 65 pound an hour. I think it equated to around, it was over 50 odd thousand pound a year to use Bottesford. Okay. And in my opinion, I looked at it and it's a situation here. Look, you know, 
I love this place. I love the people here. You know, there's no dispute in that. Um, but that's not the reason. You know, the reasons for coming to Wilkeston are not because we're going to rebrand or merge. I mean, I've never heard so much nonsense in my entire life, honestly. Can you, for the fans then, just completely dismiss any rumours and completely say now there will never be a merger of Scunthorpe United and Ilkeston Town? I find it laughable. I find it laughable, people comparing it to Milton Keynes. Of course there's no merger. First of all, any one of you, please tell me a benefit to merging two clubs. One that's at step three, that is fully self-sustainable with great facilities, 100 miles away from the other, and the other is a much, much bigger club with a fantastic fan base, stadium, is all it needs is a few areas tweaking. Yeah, I get that. Where would I benefit from merging the clubs? In, in what way? Milton Keynes was a different scenario. Milton Keynes was a, was a town or a city that didn't have a football team, but had a 30,000-seater stadium or whatever, 25,000-seater stadium. It was you know, a, a new area, a Red new location. It didn't, have, it didn't have a football club. Wimbledon was a club that was about to go out of business. Correct, yeah. The owner purchased Wimbledon to relocate to Milton Keynes so that they could skip six or seven leagues and be straight into the football yeah. league. Ilkeston with Milton Keynes. In the pyramid, then There's one league between them. Yeah. I mean, where on earth would that benefit? I mean, it, and the FA wouldn't allow it anyway. I mean, honestly, there's so much that comes out. Some of it I laugh at. Some of it are bang my head against walls. Some of it I understand. But that's the most nonsensical comment and, and stuff that I've, that I've ever seen. And maybe, I don't mean that disrespectful to people that maybe don't understand it, you know, but for anyone that understands football that asks that question, need to go and splash some water on their eyes because that is just ridiculous. I mean, Ilkeston Town, quite simply, is a venue. That's all it is, a venue. Nobody comes and watch these lads train and arguably, if I made the lads sign a non-disclosure <laughs> and never told anyone, no one would ever know we were training here. Yeah. You know, the fact of the matter is... Well, I think it might, might get out some way or well, another. But, yeah. <laughs> but nobody goes to watch training. And I, I appreciate that everybody wants it within the community. And I do. This would be, and I'll, I'll say this on camera now, at the very most for one season. At the very most for one season. Because I'm already in discussions with a piece of land I, I mentioned to you earlier that it, it, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, just because there's an illness and there's power of attorneys involved. But there's a piece of land behind the football club, which is just underneath the... Um, the bridge? The, the viaduct. viaduct. The viaduct yeah. um, so literally, it's a two-minute walk. Now, it's what that means. It's 15 acres. What that means is I can put an artificial 4G surface, floodlights, another four grass pitches. I can have the academy there. You know, if the academy continues or when the academy eventually comes back, um, hopefully it's the, the, the first one of that. Um, well, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it can have everybody there. Yeah. You know, it, it can have everybody there and it will be. A, and, and that's what the goal is. Now, if that deal happens within the next two months or three months and I can get a grass pitch installed quick enough, they might not be here at all. You know, there might be a couple of months. As soon as there is a pitch ready, you know, at Scumthorpe, the lads will go back to Scumthorpe and they'll all be made fully aware of that. Um, and at the very, very most, they will be here for a season if we struggle to find somewhere and get it ready quick enough. That's, that's as simple as it is. This is purely a facility that I will help Ilkeston as much as we can as a club yeah. because of the allegiances I've got and the love I've got for the club. I will, you know, if there's, because there's not much of a step between the clubs as well, if any of our fringe players or any of our players coming back from that need fitness or, or anything else, if we can help the club without having, you know, any, any adverse, effects. adverse effect on us, we will, you know, almost certainly we will. And that's the same here. They're just helping me, you know, and helping us because we need a facility short term. And, you know... So you quoted the figure that Bottisford... So you mentioned the figure that Bottisford quoted. Mm -hmm. Can we ask about the, the fees involved in the lads' training here? Is, no it, fees. A, is it nothing at nothing. all? Nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. I mean, there's a grass pitch out the back that needs a bit of a reno, um, which will benefit Ilkeston when we go. If we're here three months, you know, they've got a fully renovated grass pitch that they don't currently use because they only train twice a week in the yeah. evenings. So... Um, 
there will be certain benefits in that respect, but it's only facilities that are maybe enhancing slightly to benefit us while we use the facilities, yeah. and they will benefit from that. But financially, n nothing, no. But I guess that's still you just putting back into your local community as well, even if even if the Scunthorpe are only here three, four months. You know, it's just oh, I don't, you as I a don't local... Begrudge spending, yeah. I don't begrudge spending a bit of money here if it benefits yeah. both clubs, yeah, of course I don't. Yeah. But, you, you know, it may be when we don't have to come here at all. Um, one thing I will say is the statement that I put out at the weekend, like with the academy, with everything else, it's pulled up a few meerkats. There's a few heads popped up and, and people now starting to talk about things that, you know, they, they want to get in. Exactly. And, it, and it's created more possibilities for us uh, and things may happen quicker than originally anticipated. So, um, but certainly the maximum that we would be here would be a season. Absolutely nothing to, the clubs will not interact. They will train in the evenings as they always do. We will train full time. You know, our players will eat here. Our staff will remain, and I'm sure you're going to get onto the staffing side of things at some point in the interview. But all of our staff, when I mentioned I was closing, I meant I was closing to the public um, as much. All of our staff that we do keep will remain at Glamford Park. You know, the stadium will be kept maintained yeah, yeah. And, and sort of things. So the only people that will be here will be the players and anybody that the players need for the period that they're here to, to assist them. And, and um, can you also then confirm that, barring us, Scunthorpe playing Ilkeston in a pre-season friendly, you know, other than that happening, there is no plans and Scunthorpe United will absolutely not play any home fixtures here? Never. Never, ever. Absolutely not. The only, if there was potentially a pre-season friendly between the two teams. If there's be. a pre-season friendly, they'll yeah. come here because obviously that helps Ilkeston. Yeah. You know, we, we, we've got a great fan base. Yeah. We would bring a good crowd down here. Half of them will want to be nosy, I should yeah. imagine. Um, you know, and um, a few of them might want to come and shout at me. But, you, you, you know, we will have a, a, a pre-season friendly here yeah. um, because of the relationship between yeah, the yeah. clubs. Um, y, y, you know, and, and that's the only time we'll play a fixture on this pitch, yeah. OK, I think you've covered up most things about Ilkeston then. I think, um, I know we're going to go later on to questions from the fans, but I think we've, we've covered quite a, a, a long range of topics then. And I think this interview has turned out to be quite a, well, it's a hard-hitting one, isn't it? You know, we're getting to the to, to the knock of a lot of topics that are, well, at the forefront of a lot of Scunthorpe United fans, and I hope we're putting to rest some of these anxieties. The next one that I want to ask is, um, one that I've, again, I know Twitter... You shouldn't really be looking there for, for these rumours. But one thing that I saw pop up was, um, you know, a potential relationship between yourself and Peter Swan prior to the sale or even post-sale. Can you just confirm to us now if you have had any relationship with Peter Swan prior to you approaching to buy the football club? None at all. So predominantly most of the discussions, um, I just, I will reiterate, you, you know, I know the history between Peter Swan and the supporters, of course I do, it's quite apparent. Um, but in, in the business that has been carried out through him and his lawyers and, and the agent, it's all been really smooth. You know, I've had, you know, it happened very quickly, so it had to have been. Um, uh, and, you know, for that, there is a respect there, I'm, I'm, you know, from a business point of view. Um, but it's been very good. Um, but... No, I, 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 this came up um, on my timeline because of local interest in Scunthorpe um, at the time, you know, so towards very close to when I, I purchased the club, it, it, it came up that there was some local interest from, from Alan. Um, I was obviously looking for another club, you, you know that, because I was interested in Barry at the time and, um, and I decided to have a look. You never know what you're going to get. You never, you know, there's a lot of hearsay on social media, as we know, and a lot of nonsense. Um, so I, I contacted Begby Trainer. Um, didn't know Peter Swan. Never spoke to Peter Swan. Um, I knew what I'd read on Google and and everywhere else. Um, I contacted Begby Trainer to ask questions. They very very quickly wanted to put me under a, um, an NDA. Um, and then before they would give me the relevant information that I would need to make a decision on whether I'm going to purchase the club, I had to provide evidence that I was serious, i.e. proof of funds. funds yeah. And that wasn't just proof of funds. 
contrary to the, the belief of some of them on social media that have offered me six pound, I think, back for the club. Um, it was a little bit more than six pound. It was enough to purchase the stadium, the land. It was enough to purchase, um, obviously, the company and, and any other assets that the company had. And it also needed to account for the fact there was an amount in a cash flow forecast that was needed to keep yeah. the club running until <clears throat> the end of the season, which was a league stipulation. So there were certain things that I had to, to provide straight away, which I did to Begby Trainer. They provided me the information. Um, I had a full team on it for three or four days where we were looking for everything, at going backwards and forwards with questions. And then eventually the, um, I got to a point where I needed to be. And then it was arranged with, by, Beg, by, by Begby Trainer for me to meet Peter Swan at, at the stadium um, to have a look around and discuss the, the final detail of, of, the, of the deal. And, and that happened. We shook hands on the deal on that day. And then it went back to the to the lawyers and the agent again, and, and and that was it. That was as simple as it was. I've had I've obviously had several conversations with Peter Swan since the takeover. Um, partly, you know, some of it was to do with banking situations and the transitions, um, and obviously to do with the the lawyers that are dealing with the land sale at the minute. So and, and the the stadium. So um, that's it. That's it. There's certainly, I don't know Peter personally. I don't, certainly don't have any axe to grind, you, you, you know. Um, I guess you said the the deal was relatively smooth. The one outstanding thing from the deal is the sale of the land. Um, we understand that there's still, but you know, anyone who's bought a house understands that completion <clears throat> takes a while. Is that still on track? Yeah, 100%. 100%. I'm actually in with the lawyers tomorrow. Um, just to run through a few bits and bobs. Do you have any timescales on when that may complete? Um, the date is the 24th of May, so I'll know more tomorrow if there's anything flagged up, you know, any searches that are flagged up where there's any more searches got to be done that may prolong that. I don't I don't envisage it going over that date, um, but like I say, I'm in with the lawyers at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning, so um, it's with the lawyers, everything's ready to go. Um, like you say, in a normal house purchase, you you know, I buy land and property for a living. You know, you know, it's you'll have you'll have searches carried out. You know, if you're having a mortgage, you'll get your mortgage offer in place. You, you know, you do all of that, and it and it's six to eight weeks with no chain, as I mentioned before. When you're purchasing a football club, and this football club has there's a lot of checks. There's, I mean, the football club itself. There's five different titles for a start. You know, um, so that's five different land registry titles. That the stadium and the surrounding land and bit of different bit. There's there's a piece next to Costa Coffee that's on one title. There's a ransom strip or some sort of some sort of strip of land that's on another title. There's the car park on the title, the training pitch on the title. There's the so you know then you've got phone masks that are on leases and there's leases involved with other things and agreements that are in place that are able to use. So there's a hell of a lot more than just buying a house that the lawyers need to look into. And I knew full well it would take a number of months for that to happen. Um, and the issue is, if I'd, if I'd have not purchased a club and waited for it all to complete, I'm sure many people would have been a lot happier on the basis yeah. of the way the deal was structured, but arguably you wouldn't have had a football club. Yeah, I think it had to happen. We touched on our podcast, didn't we, on, on Monday, release on Tuesday. A deal needed to, to a sale needed to happen quite quickly. We, we <clears> knew we were getting into dangerous territory, so no, I think that answers that. I guess my next question would be: You mentioned earlier, you know, Ilkeston, you're you've been a big part of this club, and but yet you were still looking to move away and get another a new opportunity, a bigger opportunity. What can you say to Scunthorpe like United fans who are very pleased with you being the owner and chairman, and maybe are worried about you taking on a bigger and better opportunity elsewhere? Can you confirm that you're here to stay, basically? At Scunthorpe? Yes. 100% I'm here to stay. I mean, obviously times, the difficult times and and some of the stuff that, that has been fired at me over the last few weeks, um, I'm a little bit aggrieved about, I'm not going to lie. Um, but like I say, 99% of it was fully expected. Um, I saw one comment which it tickled me, if I'm honest. He says, it's it's like my wife leaving me and cheating on me and leaving and then finding out my new girlfriend sleeps around. You know, that, that, <laughs> that's something that was put, which tickled me a little bit. 
you know. Um, so, but there's a lot of jest out there. There's a lot of joking. There's, you know, and then there's a lot of seriousness. And the seriousness yeah. is people are concerned. And whatever business it is, whether it's, you know, if you've got a prolonged um, sort of history of failure over over a recent number of years, yeah. and the club has, it's, that's not me slandering anybody, it's not me slandering ex-players, managers, owners, nothing like that. It's there for everybody to see. The club has failed miserably over the last few years and, and it's been falling down the league because of it. And I, I guess a lot of fans feel like they're coming out the back end of a toxic relationship. Mm -hmm. And I guess what I'd say to you is, a lot of it might be, it is, is nervousness, is people very curious and apprehensive. Um, obviously, I can't speak for the people that have been quite personal. And But I get that. I, f I fully get that. You know, and I fully get why people are sat on the fence and don't want to publicly back me or, or privately back me or anything else until they've seen. But what I can't condone, what I can't understand, and certainly... I don't care about trolls. I don't care about cowards that hide behind fake names. I'm not interested in that. It, you know, they, they won't get the time of day. Um, I don't care about supporters from other clubs. Um, genuine supporters of this football club need to remain positive. We all need to remain positive. Now, I understand that that's difficult, and I understand that, you know, that there are going to be scepticisms and nervousness and, and, and lack of trust. I get that. And, and I don't think it's just me. I think whoever came in would probably feel the same thing, apart from maybe maybe Simon, because yeah. obviously he's a supporter and, and you know, and his consortium. And I, and I get that. And maybe that has fueled some of it as well, because maybe the local lads um, didn't quite get it over the line. Maybe they would have. If I hadn't have stepped in, maybe they wouldn't have and the club would have disappeared. You know, who, who knows what would have happened there? I um, think even if they had have, if they had have managed to get it into, I don't think we'd have seen the level of investment that we've already seen. A question, Gareth, how do you feel about that? Do you agree with that statement? Um, yeah, I think there was still concern about it. Before, yeah. Definitely... Well, to be honest with you, you'd have had to have seen the investment because most of the investment that's gone in at the minute has had to have gone in. You know, we're talking staff wages, players' wages. We're yeah. talking HMRC, which is you know, close to half a million pound already. In, and to be fair to, to Sam and, and, and Ian, they did say that, didn't they? That there was they were exploring every possible option if they did become successful. I, I've spoke to Simon to... several times. He messages me privately and I like him. I like him. He's got some fantastic ideas and I've openly said to him that once, once the dust settles a little bit and I can, first and foremost, I, I have a plan. I have to start the implementation of that, them plans. I have to get them plans working and in process and everybody buying into them plans for this to work. And is that plan to make the club sustainable? That's the only plan. That's the only plan. It has to be sustainable. People talk about my wealth. You know, I'm not the wealthiest football owner in the world. You know, football club owner, I'm not. It's, it's as simple as that. I'll hold my hands up to that. You know, shoot me. You know, I'm not. I don't have the funds to put into this football club year in, year out. And why would you want me to? Let's, let's, let's be honest about it. Let's say I came in and said I'm going to invest £30 million, which I don't have, by the way, and I will confirm that. <laughs> but let's say I said I was going to invest £30 million into Scunthorpe United Football Club over the next three years, and we had some great success. But then my money runs out, or I get bored, or I get hit by a bus, or I have a heart attack, you know, and I disappear. Yeah. So I'm just laughing at Gareth there. <laughs> Yeah. Laughing at me, potentially having a heart attack. Not you, Dick. We've been found out yesterday. I've had a mini heart attack. I've got some scarring on my heart. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, yeah, the scar is caused by a mini heart attack. So, this is an important message. So, Gary can't buy the club. For you at home, <laughs> if you think something's wrong, please get it checked <laughs> out. <laughs> but, um, um, but you didn't know you had a heart or a heart attack. Well, my wife's not. She said many other things as well, Gary. <laughs> but, I mean, in respect of. Eventually, either the money runs out, the love runs out, illness kicks in, something happens. Now, when that happens, if you're not running sustainably, you end up back in this situation. Whether that's two, three, four, five years' time, you end up back in the same situation. Maybe worse. You know, maybe, maybe then it's insurmountable. You can't get over it. Someone's not, you know. And, and this club had it. This club had it. You, you, you know, several times this club went out of business and back, you know, and back again. Do you, would you not sooner have a sustainable club mm. 
that sustains at a level where the investment goes into the infrastructure of the club, which then helps the club make the money itself, yeah. you know, to generate the funds for, for the playing budget so that you know that your playing budget is covered. And regardless of what happens to me as an owner, regardless of what happens moving forward, you know that you've always got a football club, first and foremost. And, and that is what I've said from day one. I have a plan. It has to be sustainable. I don't have the funds to, you know, to, to put into this football club for 10 years and compete. I simply don't. Um, but I have enough without killing myself and taking away my family's future to do something special with Scumfort. I do. And, and that's what I'm looking to do. I guess another difficult decision that was made, um, that, that what came out in the statement was... In fact, I can't remember if it was touched on in the statement, I presume it was, but um, they mentioned that we will obviously go part-time off, this is aside from the playing side, office admin side, we're going to go part-time from next season. Did you feel like that was necessary? The staff going part-time? Yes, sorry, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, again, it perhaps didn't come across exactly how it was meant to in the interview. I appreciate that. The interview was kind of rushed. It was on a match day. It was the first time that I'd been up at the club to be able to do it. Did um, you feel quite emotionally charged during the interview? I think on Saturday I was quite angry. And I, I did it after the game as but well. Because of the performance or because of the Well, that online? added to it. That added to it. But, but obviously the build-up... I had a tough week last week. You know, I, I was in bed for a couple of days. I went very well. Hence why I probably had my, phone, my head in my phone longer than I should have. Hence why I made the decision to come off social media because... I was perhaps looking at things longer than I normally would. Um, and then just started to get a feel that... Um, just felt like shit, I'm not going to lie. I felt like shit last week. And so Saturday kind of capped that off. Then we had the performance that we had, you know. Um, and, yeah, it it probably was a little bit emotionally charged. Um, I know people saying it was fully scripted and this, that. It wasn't scripted. I'll tell you, you know, the initial opening statement that I made and, and the conclusion um, I read, I'll be openly honest, I, I, I wrote it myself, but I, but I read yeah, that. Yeah. But then I had a list of all the topics that needed to be covered and that was just spoken about yeah. as it needed to be. There, there was no scripts. Um, and I wanted to cover everything. Um, but, it, you know, when you're in that situation, it perhaps don't come across. So going back to the staffing side, what I said was, is there would undoubtedly be redundancies. And I, and I stand by that, there will be. Um, but that isn't a case where I'm going up to Glanford Park and I'm boarding up the windows, and I'm chaining up the gates and I'm going to watch, you know, watch the place rust and I'm going to leave bird shit all over the seats that I've seen on, you know, and I'm going to leave the place to rot. That's not, and, and the staff are all just going to be marched out the door yeah. and given bus fare home. You know, that's not what was going to happen. It was never what was going to happen. What will happen is the club will scale down because of the level we're at it will scale down. So the times that it is open to the general public will be less. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it will be less. It has to be less. There are certain departments where, certainly if Ilkeston, sorry, it's gone for, but at Ilkeston, um, where things like restaurants won't be open, you know, during the day, where at the moment they are because they feed the players. So... But again, that could change because if all of a sudden we get a training facility open. If that's so there, expedited. Yeah. So there's still a lot that can happen. But it's not a case where I'm going to be sitting down with staff and saying, right, off you go. You notice period is such and such. I'm going to sit down with every staff member that's full time at the football club. The casual staff of the casual staff will still need them anyway. So, because predominantly they're match days. So I'll be sitting down with every staff member and we will look at how many of those are happy to go or want to go because it's been a, a, a traumatic time yeah, for some of them. Yeah. So, some a lot of them through. have been looking for other jobs because they know that the club was on death's door. So arguably they've been looking for other jobs. Like two of the lads in the commercial department had job offers. They didn't conveniently get job offers because David Hilton came in and they thought he was a wanker. You know, that's not what I'm... Can I swear, by the way? Yeah, yeah do it. well, um, maybe not do what you want. <laughs> yeah, but... We, 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 we do... We're not keen on nudity, but... <laughs> right, okay. Well, I'm not. Neither Marco, is, on the other hand... Neither is my missus, where I'm concerned. <laughs> hey, but, uh, go on. No, you've seen the podcast. It does get quite blue, to be fair, yeah. But, I mean, it, it's not a case where these lads have all of a sudden thought, you know, 
I like the staff. I get on with all the staff. But it's a case where we, I've got to sit with the staff. I've got to look at who are happy to go, yeah. but they haven't gone because they don't want to let the club down and leave the club in the lurch. You know, I need to understand that. I need to understand that who can drop to part-time, who can drop in salary, you know, who can drop hours, who we can move from one job to maybe another, who can go to match day and a bit more casual, and look at the whole process and try and work with all the staff that we can to make sure that there isn't too many upset people. Because at some point, arguably, this is a short-term fix. Yeah. We're going to need them back, yeah. or certainly people to fill their positions. So it, it's not a case. Glanford Park will still be open. There will still be stadium managers. There will still be security managers. There will still, you know, that manage the security for match day. There will still be groundsmen. There will still be volunteers that, that are coming around and tidying the stadium. There'll still be cleaners. There'll still be, um, y- you know, I'll be honest, uh, Steph that works in the hospitality. She's my favourite person at the club. You know, I've not even had a chance to sit down with her yet. Steph Dave will you. <laughs> <laughs> but, y- y- you know, I don't want people to... I think the portrayal of the statement that I put out the weekend is... He is the monster that people are trying to portray that he is. I, I don't and know about that. I think a lot of people were concerned, if I can say this, that it happened with in-house in the club mm-hmm. and it wasn't done with fans or on the radio. I think I think people would have liked to have seen that. So, you know, we are very grateful that you've come onto this platform to do that. I don't I don't necessarily think the statement was particularly negatively received across the board, you guys. No, I mean, like I said, a lot of it you can sort of understand it's being must. Um, but yeah, like I said... A lot of it, like you said, was the fact it was done in in house. Mm-hmm. People maybe thought like the questions were sort of tailored towards. I think yourself. you've got to remember. I mean, it was rushed. Yeah, of course. And yeah. it was rushed because I was coming on the back. I, I was coming to the game. I nearly, to be honest, I wouldn't have come to the game on Saturday. I'd have watched it at home because I didn't feel a hundred percent. I was still at the tail end of, of an illness, so um, it was a situation for me. I felt that I had to because there was so much coming out. And the, pro- the biggest problem you've got is when I ducked out of social media because I didn't want to fire back at idiots because I weren't in a great place because of the stuff that was being spoke, the way I was being spoken about. It's not nice, you know, when your partner's asking you if you're okay, you know, because they, they can see that you're down, your family can see that you're down, you know, and I'm a nightmare when I'm ill anyway. So it is a situation where I took myself off for that reason. But the, and, and I also took myself off for the reason that when you're on social media, I want to respond to everybody. But the problem is I don't respond to cowards and idiots. But then if I don't, it looks like I'm ducking, ducking the, question the question and I've got something to hide. Which is exactly what happened when I came off. I came off so that I could just avoid... And then all of a sudden, it's because someone from Barry jumped on me and started asking me uncomfortable questions. Utter shit, utter shit. I came off because I was sick of seeing negativity at a time when I'm extremely positive about the club, about the future, about what I can achieve and what my team can achieve, what Jimmy can achieve, what the players can achieve. And... and the supporters will see that, I think, in, in due course. Just coming back to the um, the changes in the staff then, do you expect that that kind of return to its current level as we get back into the National League? Of course. We go I mean, down and then back into the we're, football? We're, listen, the mechanics of the club is is going gonna, is gonna to slow up. It's, it's, it's going it's gonna to ease. We have no choice about that. You know, we're not in this position because of me. You, you know, I can only remedy the situation I've inherited. You know, so the, the situation is we have things that we have to do. It's uncomfortable. But again, people are saying the staff found out about, you know, that they they were going to be made redundant. Well, no staff found out they were going to be made redundant on an interview with me because we've not even decided who's going to go. We've got to sit down with all these. All I said was they would be redundancies. Yeah. And everybody at that football club knows there are going to be cost-cutting exercises. They know there are going to be redundancies. I don't need to tell them. You know, all I will say is, we are. I am very respectful of the people that are at the club. Um, I'm very respectful of the fact that they've worked tirelessly in some difficult times, and I'm certainly not to, looking to, to to throw anybody out the door. We are going to look to try and accommodate everybody as as much as we can, without it impacting the progression of the football club. 
before we go to the fans' questions, I'll just ask two more. So my next one is um, regarding Jimmy Dean and the opportunity that you've given him to manage at national league level. And do you think you, well, I presume I know the answer to this, but will you continue to invest in his squad and will you give him every opportunity to succeed next season, regardless of what league we're in? Presumably it will be National League North. Will you give him every opportunity possible to succeed? 100%. I will make this clear, and Jimmy knows. Jimmy's an honest, an honest guy. Jimmy knows the pressures that he's going to be under next year are going to be very different. So what he was under here, but the when expectation I, will be different. The expectation will be different, and the pressures from me as a chairman over a manager will be different. You know, he knows that. People have mentioned that I knew Jimmy Dean personally. You know, people that want to pretend that they're in the know, um, and they got all this inside information. And I was friends with Jimmy Dean. I'd spoken to Jimmy Dean twice over the phone um, prior to to him being offered the job face to face. Um, I'd never met Jimmy Dean prior to Scum, prior to me owning Scunthorpe United. Um, I'd had a couple of deal, dealings with players that were coming to Ilkeston um, with, with Jimmy. I knew of his record. I knew how highly thought of he was at this level, um, and and you know how much he's done at, at these levels to work his yeah. way up. He had a side. People may not like this, but one eye was obviously on the fact. We knew we were coming. I was coming into a difficult task of keeping us up. I knew that, you know, it was, a, it was the best will in the world to bring thirteen players that aren't currently playing at their clubs, either via injury or not being selected, to then throw them together, and try and gel a squad in the time we had left, to create, basically playoff form, to keep us up. Yeah, yeah. Was a real, real task. And I'm not saying we've given up. You know, we won't give up until, until it's physically impossible. Uh, mathematically impossible, but we knew it was a difficult task. So one I had to be on, plan B, worst case scenario. And there's no better manager available, or no, be no better manager about, in my opinion, than the up-and-coming Jimmy Dean now. He had a, he had a side, he, he's used to winning a completely different curve to this football club. Um, he's used to winning football matches. That's first and foremost, and it's infectious. You know, Jimmy, Jimmy is infectious with his passion, with everything that he does. And the fact that we are going to be at a level that he understands, and arguably I understand a lot more, um, the likelihood is we'll be at that level, I think he'll be extremely successful. He had a side, people talk about playing budgets, you know, he had a playing budget of less than, it was 6,800 quid, I believe. Um, don't hold me to that but it was in and around them figures, £6,800. He was under embargo for six months at the club he was at. He left the club while it was still in embargo. Couldn't sign any players. Um, and he had them one, side out, one, one, one place outside the playoffs in a league he'd only just gone up to. Um, that, that's, you know, arguably we will have a playing budget significantly high. Well, it's not arguably. Certainly have a, a playing budget significantly higher than that. The players that we can attract to the football club because the fan base and because of what we're doing will be significantly better than no disrespect than what Peter Sports can. So Jimmy will have everything at his disposal to be successful. Now, I can't guarantee that he's going to be. I have every ounce of confidence that he will, yeah. but I can't guarantee that he will. And he knows he's under pressure next season. Um, but he has my full back in, 100%. So last one for me then, Dave. Financially, the club that you inherited in Scunthorpe United, was it in the position you expected it to be in? Or were there lots of skeletons in the closet? How did it compare to your expectations financially? Uh, pretty much. I mean, I'm obviously going to miss things. Um, and there'll be, thing, there'll be a few surprises along the way. It's, it's a business that is over 100 years old. Um, it's had many, many owners. And, it, you know, there's, there's things around the stadium, you know, staff. You know, th there's a lot of things to take into account, um, you know, severance packages for people that are no longer at the club. So, you know, and some of it was arguably, shouldn't have been, but was probably missed because of the speed of the process. Um, I think my biggest concern at the time when I was buying the club is that time was getting the completed, getting the deal completed was, was the key. To give us chances. To so give that. us a chance. Um, and arguably, I cut corners in the due diligence that maybe in 
in other circumstances, you know, maybe if it was in the close season, I certainly would have spent a lot more time. Um, but we didn't have that. And, and like I say, to be honest, the books were in good order. Um, I'm not saying the figures were healthy, but the, the books were in good order. It was order. clean. And, it, yeah. and, and most of it was yeah. pretty much as expected. Um, I did expect certain things to work with the club a little bit more, maybe the HMRC to work with the club a little bit more. Um, but I think now, and it, 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 it's the same with any football club, Everybody seems to frown on football clubs. No one's, you know, the merchant facilities regarding the season tickets. You know, I know people talk about, well, you can put a bond in and, you know, well, there's no difference. If I'm going to put a bond in, it's, you may as well hold the money. Yeah. There's no difference, e e whichever way. Um, whichever way we look at it. And, and they were things that you weren't expecting. You don't expect to say, OK, well, we can sell £200,000 worth of season tickets but then we're going to get the money at £10 per person again. Yeah. When we can sell them on a match day, no disrespect to supporters. But if we're going to get 10 we may as well wait and get £20. Pre presumably the merchants charge a fee as well. They charge a fee yeah, and, then, and then they want to hold the money. Or uh, I mean, to be fair, we've not been given the option to put a bond in. Um, I do believe the previous regime had a, had a bond in place. But I, I don't see the difference. I don't see the difference of however the money is there the club aren't receiving the benefit, you know. I may as well put the two, the two hundred grand into the club. Let's put it into the merchant provider yeah. and not sell season tickets. So, you know, which I am doing. So, it, it, there's certain things that were a surprise. Um, not many nice surprises. Most of them are, are of the other variety. Yeah. But you, you know, you kind of expect that when you buy a business. It's as old as it is, as as, as closely watched as it is, and in the public eye. Um, the amount of staff that it has in the position that it was in, um, you, you expect, you expect things. So, well, I think we've covered all the topics I certainly wanted to ask. We'll go to the fans' questions now. Um, I yeah. hope it's a bit more snappy than yeah. what we've just yeah. done. Some, <laughs> some of them, I guess, will be a lot like yeah. light-hearted questions. Yeah, of course. Well. Like, like, what, just, this is just what obviously fans on Twitter want a little bit more information on. But now we won't have. Okay, Marco, over to you then. Yep. Uh, so first we've got Alex, um, and he's thinking, unless there's something missing, the fact that we're going to be training on an artificial 4G pitch all week, and then playing on a normal grass on a Saturday, will this have an impact on the team? Okay, so there is a, a grass training facility at Orchestra as well. So um, this is what I spoke about earlier, where there'll be a little bit of, of money put in. Um, obviously, if we do end up being here, if things materialise that happen quicker than expected, um, we may not need to be. But if we do end up here, um, which is the plan at the moment, then there'll be a grass training facility, right. which the players will be on most of the time. There'll be drainage put in place and, and there'll be a grass facility here, um, which will just, just work. So this would only get used if, if needed with weather? The, the, the 4G... Um, well, they'll have, they'll have it, that'll be Option. entirely up to the players. Yep. That'll be up to Jimmy that he can decide which he wants to use at that time. Um, yep. And that'll be down to him. Then I've got another one off Becky. And she's asked if, obviously, you've mentioned redundancies and obviously people cutting back their hours, will we be relying on any volunteers to keep the club running? I mean, the more volunteers, the better. Right, okay. Um, I will say that certainly at, at the levels, but any football club at any level, you know. Volunteers are fantastic. Yeah. They're the heartbeat of, of, of the club. They're certainly the heartbeat of a club of this size. Right. I know Scunthorpe's a lot, a lot bigger, but arguably we, they're much bigger with a much bigger fan base. So that arguably there should be more volunteers. And, and I'm happy to open the doors to any volunteers that, that want to carry out any any improvements or anything that, that will benefit the football club if, if they've got some free time, you know. And I'll be forever thankful. Yeah. Um, so. We won't be relying on them. Whatever don't get done by volunteers will get done. Um, that I can promise. But, you know, if there are volunteers to do it, great. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Gareth, over to you for one. All right, then. Damo75. Is that his um, real name? Oh, I don't know his real name. It's <laughs> on Twitter, isn't it? Damo75. That's all I've got. I guess it's Damien, who's born in 1975. Um, he'd like to know, as a lot of people have asked about the club badge, have you considered about changing it back? No. Maybe don't know this. It's a simple answer. I, I, I have seen in the early stages of taking over that people were bringing up sort of an old, an older yeah, emblem type easy. badge. And whilst I'm not completely against the idea, I mean, I rebranded this place when I came in, 
I believe there are better things to speak. You've got to remember, this rebranding, a, the rebranding a badge yeah. Yeah, yeah, is rebranding awesome. the whole club yeah. Yeah. from the signage to the programs yeah. to the, you know, to, to the signs inside the stadium to to stationery to the the tickets. There's just so much of an expense to rebrand a club as a whole, yeah. and it's an expense that's not necessary at yeah. the moment. Yeah. So it, it's nothing to do with the fact I'm against. You know, if the supporters in the future, when we're in a financially better position, yeah. want to do that, then you know it's something arguably they, they, they can have a vote on. But right now, there's there's yeah. there's other priorities. Yeah, also, Martin Jewett as well. This has been covered earlier. In fairness, he says for me, I hope he can categorically say we will never play a home league game at Elmston. A home league game? No, of course we won't. Never, never. Mark Ma- <laughs> going? Yep. So I've got one off. I've just got Steve. Uh, if there's any possibility. That the deal for the land and the ground might collapse, and if so, where would it leave the club? No possibility. I mean, it has to happen for Peter Swan as much as it has to happen for, for us as a club. You know, there's complexities, of course, there's complexities to any deal of that yeah. value. Um, but no, the, the deal will happen, the club will own the stadium. I know people are massively concerned about that, they don't need to be, yeah. they really don't need to be. Right. Yeah, another one from Jarek Zesna. <laughs> I get the names, don't I? <laughs> um, <laughs> Zen, oh, yeah. he, he knows. Pete. Producer yeah. Pete, by the way, doing absolute bits yeah. for us. <laughs> um, yeah, it just said, this is also being covered. I'm just asking questions. That yeah, but it's good for them to feel like that. Yeah, it just says, make sure to ask him when the coaching staff of the academy had been notified by him or his team what was happening. When? Have the coaching yeah. staff. But obviously, you mentioned that. Yeah, well, I've, show, I've, show, yeah, I've showed you the evidence yeah, yeah, yeah. that, that yeah. I notified yeah. the relevant people that that was happening. And if it's not fed down the chain, I sincerely apologise on, yeah. you know, on behalf of myself and other staff members that yeah. maybe should have passed it down further down the line. But, um, but, but yeah, I've made, I've made the, yeah. the decision. I think that was a big one for everyone when it, when it came out. People didn't want to just thought they yeah. found out over sort of social media. Yeah. But like you yeah. said, you've shown us yeah, that wasn't the case. Uh, I've got a question. Oh, I've got two similar ones. Becky and Leon. Uh, Becky asks, will there be four choices of kits again for the fans to pick next season? So this year, uh, they sort of launched a poll for the four kits and that was the case. For it's it's the hard hitting stuff. Though, yeah. you know. <laughs> I think the kits have already been designed. They're already in, okay. they're already in the process of being made. Okay. And then, um, is that Macron again? And they're fantastic, by the way. Yeah, Macron. Right, okay. I'd say they do do good kits. Yeah. I, I had an input with one. Yeah. Um, is it running wide? <laughs> you are a naughty you are a naughty man that's going to be next you're a wow. naughty man you didn't think it would be Gareth that would stitch you up did you I'm just thinking is it red and white it's not <laughs> uh, you go again alright this one Rusty Iron <laughs> that's definitely his real name his <laughs> mum didn't like him that'll uh, be the stadium when I bought it <laughs> up <laughs> are there any plans to invite new board members Um. It's certainly something I'll look at in the future. Again, I need I need to implement my plan right now mm-hmm. and yeah. I need to get everybody on board with that. Um, and once we're smooth running and we're back on that upward curve, then we can look at addressing more, more involvement with, yeah. with supporters and stuff, yeah. With regards to that, uh, I've got a couple of questions of numerous people regarding Sharp and Elliot. Uh, one was, would there ever be interest in sort of striking a kind of partnership with a club with Simon Elliot? A partnership in what respect? Regarding sort of coming onto the board or um, maybe an advisory role, yeah. consultancy role. I think you've covered that. Actually, I don't, really, yeah, to be fair, I like Simon. Yeah. I, I, I back myself. I don't really need I, the, the, the place I need advisors. Well, okay. You know, I've got people in place where I need advice, you know. Um, but. I, I wouldn't wouldn't rule out, you know, like I said, I think he's got some wonderful ideas of what he was going to do. Um, I really like him from, from the brief times that we've met and, and spoken. He's been very supportive, very supportive of, of me. Um, and I've got huge respect for him. And, and of course, um, that there could be some involvement in, in the future. How that looks at, at this time, I just don't know. Okay, Phil Pinder. Your mate, isn't he? He's on Dragon's Den. Yeah. Um, is, but what happens to the players and coaching staff living north of Scunny and around? Are they going to be reimbursed for travel? Right. So, because obviously, if, if we do end up here training, so at the minute, I think 
the majority of our players come from further afield. So certainly the newer recruits, you know, we've got lads from all over because, again, we had a, a certain pool of players that we could pick from and, you know, logistically, you know, it didn't work. So we had to pull them from all over the place. So if we were basing on it now, I mean, the amount of lads that we've got in accommodation at the minute is, is quite high. Um, and it'd be no different here. You, you know, lads would have the option if, you know, you've got to bear in mind, if I have to accommodate lads temporarily down here while we're down here, then, you know, I can do it far easier than I can up there because I've got access to property and stuff down this end anyway. But, and I will reiterate this, the conversations that I've had in the last couple of days, like I say, that the statement at the weekend has brought a lot more, you know, It's focused a lot of minds. Yeah, and, I think and, really and I'm hopeful that our stay here, if at all, will be minimal. Maximum of a year, but minimal. And I'm talking hopefully weeks, months, you know, a few May months. May not even happen from what you said. May saying. not even happen. So, um, but, but if it does... And we've got to bear in mind that we don't even know what the squad's going to look like. The majority of the players will be out of contract in the summer. So what we have to do is we have to, you know, lads will be recruited on the basis that if we're training here in the week, we're in the centre of the country. You know, the lads that want to commute can commute. If lads are coming from further afield, they'll be accommodated. And, and it'll be the same, bearing in mind, let's say we train here and we've got a new training facility ready by September or October. And then we shift back up to Scunthorpe. There'll be a lot of lads that aren't having to go in accommodation here that will if we go to Scunthorpe. Yeah. Um, and we will just remedy that as we go. You know, we, we will deal with that as we go. Yeah, so obviously we got made aware that Sharp and Elliot paid the November wage. Uh, we were just wondering if that, well, this is from Matthew, uh, we were just wondering if that was a loan or a donation. And if it was a loan, will we get paid back? So obviously, in all the paperwork that I've had, it was a donation to the football okay. club. Um, so, um, you know, it, it's not a debt to the club. It's not something I'd be looking to to okay. refund. Okay. Okay. John G, you've got two questions. First of all, can you ask him how many of the signings were the managers? That's a good question. That. Yeah. Um, well, all of them. Right. I mean, of course, there's other people at the club, myself included. Bring when we spoke about Liam Thompson, which yeah. are, are heavily pushed for, um, and, and utilise contacts to, to achieve it. But you know, myself, Lee, um, and several others at the club, and Jimmy. Obviously, Jimmy's the main main part of it. And then there's various different you know um, sites that we've got that football clubs have access to. To so it, it's to a joint effort yeah. to bring the names to the table. Every single one of them are Jimmy's signings because if Jimmy right. says no, they don't come. It's right. that simple. And that would be the same whoever was in charge. Yeah. You know, um, you know that there is. It's, the, it's their decision. At the end of the day, it's their job. So. Yeah. Yeah. He also asks. This was sort of covered earlier as well. In fairness, it says, "Could you ask me if there's any regrets on taking over since he had his time, since he has had time to fully investigate the state of SUFC?" including its finances, because as he admitted in his interview with Radio Humberside, the whole process took around 10 days, and that seemed hardly enough time. Nailed that question one, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've been covered before, so thank you, John. Thanks, John. Yeah, and last one for me. I've got one off Paul Crosby, who, like I said earlier, just wanted to confirm if we definitely will be playing Elkston pre-season. I'm pretty certain, yeah. yeah. I'm pretty That'd certain. Be, yeah, yeah, like yeah. yeah. I, you, you know what? I think... Like I've said, I do have a lot of love for the club, yeah. the support. They were really good to me here. Yeah. Um, I know it's a much smaller fan base. They, they gave me the time to implement my plans, which I'm hopeful that Scumfort fans will. Yeah. Um, they allowed me to do what I said I was going to do. I backed up every promise I made and probably exceeded some. Um, and you've seen the facilities yeah. that a club of this size have got. And, and, it, and I think it's a situation that... If I can give anything to this club yeah. without it negatively impacting us as a club, you know, then I will um, as much as I can whenever I can. And, and, and the fact of the matter is, coming here for a pre-season for an hour, I know we'll bring, on a nice sum, hot summer day, I know we'll bring a fair few. Oh, yeah. We'll um, be here, won't we, Gareth? We'll be here. We'll be here. <laughs> yeah, well, as long as the wife has. Well. Oh, <laughs> is that a pop shot of me? Well, <laughs> I've got a question off Trev. Uh, saying, with the first team players operating 
in the week away from Scunthorpe, will that have any effect on sort of say the visit for our schools, keeping in the local community? Uh, he says he does hope there's something in place for visits and for our young ge- next generation of fans. Thank you, Mr. Hilton. And I quote, we'll be at it. Um, thank you. And no, it won't have any impact on any community commitments. You know, the end of the day, it's an hour away. Yeah. You know, we're, we're not, it's an hour up the motorway. Um, so any community commitments we will schedule and lads will will fulfil them. Yeah. Um, and arguably we will look to do more, if I'm honest, to make sure that we keep we keep the link with the community as much as certainly if we are feeling like we're being a little bit distant yeah. in, in what we're having to do to save money temporarily, then you know, I think it's more important that we involve ourselves in the community as much as we can. I was saying Mike has a very similar question to that, just about the community and local schools and yeah. Yeah. just getting involved. Have we got any more, Gareth? Yeah, okay, let's... let's, let's yeah, yeah. I was done with if, if we've got... No, that's... I think um, we'll have a look. Time we're not on one of them old VHS. We're going uh, to run out of tape, <laughs> won't we? Is there a possibility the deal for the land and ground might mm. collapse? And if so, where does that leave us? We've had this. No, so we've just had that one, yeah. Yeah, the ones you've got might... I'm, I'm, I'm having deja vu here. Yeah, tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Any, any more that we haven't... Well, I don't, I, well, I don't know. Yeah. Have you ever seen Gareth flustered? I know what it's going to hit me with now. Go on. Yeah, go on. Mm. It's going to be spaghetti or something like that, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be pancakes. <laughs> Are we going for thick American type or the little crepe? Actually, part? I just buy the um, pre made ones oh, that I just right. put in the microwave. <laughs> I tell you what, this <laughs> podcast is a joke, isn't it? <laughs> We we have all these ambitions of like nailing these hard hitting questions and we're asking about pancakes. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um any more questions from the fans? No, any anything from you guys? Have you got anything that left unanswered? A lot of mine were covered in there. Obviously mine. Yeah. Oh of course were. they were. Not a lot of mine a lot of mine were obviously the initial conversation regarding moving to Ilkston. Yeah. Like you said, it was done in the sort of heating moment, like a knee jerk, but like just clarifying it all. Yeah. Like I said the community as well yeah. community side of things and you know I wonder if you could um, reveal which players are under contract for next season if you know it may be that you don't know off the top of your head which I do is know. understandable it's, I just don't want to upset I suppose I can tell you are the, the, yeah but I suppose if I, ta- uh, if I tell you, you are then, then you kind of know who aren't <laughs> so, right okay we'll leave um, it <laughs> And, and to be fair, if they're not under contract but we want to keep them, we will fight to keep yeah, them. Okay. If they are under contract but they want to go, they'll still go. So there's not a massive amount of relevance. The only thing I'll tell you is we are actively working already now on on um, potential signings based on the worst case scenario. Okay. And um, yeah, we we we're setting the bar high. Okay. Well, I think that. Probably concludes the uh, the podcast. It's more of an interview at times, but a big big thank you, Dave, for coming on. No we worries. know that you don't do a lot of interviews and certainly don't do a lot of filmed ones. So a big big thank you for taking the time with us and inviting us down here to Ilkeston. Um Big thank you to Mark you Mark you Mark you <laughs> Mark you yeah. Gareth, aka Iron Army, and of course the people at No Film who sponsor this podcast and do a fantastic job. Producer Pete over in the corner doing absolute bits for us. Uh, I've been Barrett as always. Up the iron.